Good afternoon. Welcome to the this week's COVID-19 update with the Winnebago Tribe. Thank you for joining us. I am happy to open up the discussion this day and mark this day as a historic day for the Winnebago Tribe and the WCHS team. The first um, vaccines were received in our community today and we're going to hear more about that later in our report. And I just um, really excited to share this with you and I um, congratulate our WCHS team on all their efforts and all the public health initiatives that have been going on with the Winnebago Tribe and our task force. And, and there's just been, you know, all hands on deck um, with the safety of the Winnebago community in mind and all the efforts, all the projects. And um, there's there's um, a medicine that came to our community today. And this vaccine is going to help our people um, stay well. And I just really look forward to the information that's going to be shared and the next steps as we um, work together to ensure the wellness of our community. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Danelle Smith. Thank you, Tori. And good evening, Winnebago. Thank you for all, thank you all for joining this week's edition of the COVID-19 community update. As Tori mentioned, we are very pleased to report that WCHS has received its initial distribution of the COVID-19 vaccine. It's a very exciting and historical day for our community. This morning, we started the process of administering the vaccine to frontline health care workers. And we expect that all of our healthcare personnel who want the vaccine will be able to receive it over the course of the next few weeks. For our report today, Mona Zafonte will cover the current status report for COVID-19 cases in Winnebago. In addition, we have Laura Gamble, our Chief Operating Officer, who will provide further details about the COVID-19 vaccine. We also have Dr. Carl Sirio, who's uh, joining Laura. Um, there's Dr. Sirio, if you can see him. <laughs> Uh, he's our chief medical officer, and so he will also be uh, making some comments about the COVID-19 vaccine, and he will be available to respond to any specific questions that we might need to answer about the vaccine. We are uh, very, like I said, very excited, and um, as we get more information, of course, things are evolving and changing, and uh, as we know about the, the continued availability of the supply of COVID-19 vaccine, we will uh, share that information and update to the community. So um, it really has been a challenging year for us all. And it's great to know that we are at the beginning of the end of the COVID-19 pandemic in Winnebago. In the meantime, it is still very critical for our community to continue with those three W's that we've been mentioning, uh, wear your mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance. Just because the vaccine is is here in limited supply and is coming over the course of the next weeks and months, uh, we do still need to continue those safety precautions uh, so that we can prevent further spread and continue to enjoy our families over the holidays and into 2021 and beyond. I'll now turn it over to Mona so she can start this week's report. Thank you. So happy holidays to our Winnebago community. Um, of course, our prayers and thoughts are with the mourners today. Um, as Janelle and Tori both um, described, today is a historic day for our community. And we all know that the devastating effects that COVID-19 has had on our, our people. Today, as Janelle has described, the first administration of the doses to our frontline staff members have started. And it just always reminds us of how precious our community is and that we have been able to start the the first set of vaccines here in Winnebago, you know, started with a veteran. And I think that says a lot of our people that we respect our always our culture and our traditions. But there's been much preparation up to this point, and I appreciate all of those that have coordinated those efforts. The vaccine is our best hope to continue what our ancestors have done countless times to stand up and fight for our very existence. Our people can't afford to lose any one of our tribal members anywhere. So we still have a long road ahead of us and precautions are still needed to be adhered to. But today we took one step in a positive direction to beat this devastating virus. In the next coming months, we will continue to keep all of you posted on the next phases as we continue to get information. And I encourage all of you when asked, 
if you want the vaccine to please say yes. And another holiday is fast approaching. We continue to have many questions within our own selves, but it's up to us to make the right decision for our families. I know that we're all torn on what to do um, and how to find some kind of balance during this, this awful situation. These type of situations are not new to our people, but every time we make the right one. So I'm asking you again to look at how you're going to conduct your dinners next week and your gatherings to celebrate the new year. This is a time to reconnect with just our little immediate family uh, and try to keep those connections small. But we have a lot of media and social media that can help us um, connect with others. And then just a reminder about the testing. Um, it is only an, a, an emergency if you're experiencing trouble breathing, chest pain, confusion, uh, blue lips, uh, face or inability to stay awake or go to sleep. And if you're experiencing any of those, then please go to the 12 Clans Unity Hospital, the emergency room. Um, but if you're just having mild symptoms or you would like to schedule a test, you can call the outpatient department at 402-878-3404 to schedule the drive up test. Any testing is performed Monday through Friday. And just another reminder, the hotline and outpatient will be closed uh, for the Christmas holiday as well as the New Year's Day, but the ER always remains open. So please remember the reasons for a test. The hotline is to help to answer any questions and direct you to the right avenues. The outpatient is available for appointment only for testing to ensure that we have adequate supplies and testers for that day's patient's load. We encourage everyone that if you think that you have been directly exposed to a positive person, the next day is too soon to, to know. So we encourage you to wait five to seven days, but be mindful of your situation. And as Danelle has described, you know, make sure that you wear your mask and watch your distance. We are creative and innovative people. So I know we can figure out safe ways to still enjoy our families at this time of year. And also may the creator continue to watch over us and our families. And may he allow us to come together again someday in the future. And now I will start this week's presentation. So as of last night, we had uh, four new positive cases. And so that brings us to a total of 227 people that have contracted COVID in our community with currently 35 active cases, three deaths and 239 that have recovered from COVID. And we have 33 households currently in quarantine. So the last breakdowns for COVID cases in Winnebago, we had 54% uh, are female and 46% are male. And as you look at the age breakdown, you can see that 28% are between the ages of 20 and 29, followed pretty closely by our zero to 19 years of old age at 26%. And then our next category would be 30 to 39 years old at 17%. So this slide just indicates um, that 153 of our cases have been linked to either a close contact or there has been a positive in their, their household. So the 124 are really our initial isolated cases. And this continues to show you exactly where um, some of our people have uh, contracted uh, COVID-19 with, of course, being 153 within the households, followed by uh, 64 from so social gatherings and then 38 from family gatherings. As you can see, since the beginning with our first case back in April, there are some been a lot of peaks and valleys. Um, and so we can kind of contribute some of those to some of our holidays. Um, and so we continue to watch and monitor throughout the, the rest of the, the year. 
So I know there have been some questions about the new guidelines. Um, so what Winnebago is doing um, through the public health department is that for quarantine guidelines, if you are a non-household member of a positive and after your exposure, we will allow you to be out of quarantine on day 10. Um, but we still want you to continue to monitor, monitor for symptoms um, day till day 14. Now, if you reside in a household um, with a positive, then we will be still watching you till at least day 12 and to keep you in quarantine until then, and then monitor you still for symptoms until day 14. Um, and this is really generated from the data that we have um, looked at specifically for our population that indicated that um, non-household members usually would turn positive um, about day five to seven. And then the non-household or household members, excuse me, um, were contracting and showing symptoms at least by day 10. Um, and then I believe I'm going to turn it over to Laura to continue about the COVID-19 vaccine. All right, thank you, Mona. Uh, wanna wish everybody a good afternoon. Um, we are committed uh, with the COVID vaccine be to being transparent and keeping the community informed and updated with the COVID-19 vaccination information as it becomes available. And that changes uh, almost daily. Uh, your health and safety is our priority and we are working to establish a safe and effective process for administering COVID-19 vac vaccinations. And like Danelle and Mona both said, we were able to do that today and it went very well. Um, so kind of the timeline that we have, uh, we did um, get a limited supply today. We gave 78 doses of the Pfizer uh, COVID-19 vaccine as if people uh, have been hearing in the news, there are two different uh, vaccines right now, Pfizer and then Moderna, which has not uh, gone through the FDA approval yet, but will uh, soon, we hope. Uh, the vaccine will be given as an injection into the muscle and as a series of two doses given three weeks apart. So you get the first dose and then three weeks later, uh, we give a, a second dose of the same um, vaccine. Um, you have to receive both doses in order to get the immunity that we uh, is desired and that we need. Uh, in accordance with CDC's distribution plan, the COVID-19 vaccine will be distributed in three phases. And we started phase one today. Uh, phase one is being offered to healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities. And the healthcare personnel are, are, are defined as paid and unpaid people serving in healthcare settings who have the potential for direct or indirect exposure to patients or infectious materials. Long-term care facility residents are defined as adults who reside in facilities that provide a variety of services, including medical and personal care, to persons who are unable to live independently. Phase two, the vaccine will be offered to high-risk populations and other essential workers. And right now we're working, and you know, Mona's working hard on who are those other essential workers and um, you may be getting some calls. Uh, there may be some calls that go out to the community on some of, to some of those essential workers in the future. And then phase three, the vaccine will be offered to the general population. So potential side effects of COVID vaccine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Dr. Serio kind of go over a few of those side effects. Uh, he's with me right now and Go from there. Yep. So thanks, everybody, and, and good afternoon also, and happy holiday wishes. Um, so the first thing I think is before going through a list of side effects is to recognize that for most people, the side effects will be non-existent or very minimal. The, the, the work that Pfizer did and Moderna did suggests that only about 10 to 15 percent, so one in 10 to one in seven or eight people will get a side effect that might be considered a bit annoying. The most common one will be that, in fact, you get some soreness in your arm like you do when you get a flu shot or a tetanus shot. Uh, other folks have found that they've been somewhat tired, they've had headache or muscle aches, some chills, joint pain. Uh, but bottom line is that most of these have also been mild um, and they've been very limited to about 48 hours. 
So the good news is basically relatively few people will get side effects. They'll be relatively short in duration. Um, and they are not, I think it's really important to recognize that they are not the disease. There are symptoms of the flu, but they are not COVID because the vaccine does not contain any live virus. Now, you may have heard that there are reports in the country, both in England and the United States, in fact, in a native community in Alaska as of, as of yesterday, that a very few people, four, have gotten some significant uh, responses that have been negative with, with shortness of breath, uh, swelling of the airway, that is the throat and the face. But those people were more than likely not predisposed to severe reactions because they had had a history of severe reactions to this type of an injection in the past. So we actually, as we administered, are asking people whether they've had this kind of a problem in the past. Uh, we are monitoring people uh, for 15 minutes to 30 minutes after the shot to make sure there are no problems. Obviously, as a healthcare institution, we're capable of managing any problems that develop. But be assured that those four people represent a very, very, very small and tiny fraction of the tens of thousands and probably now hundreds of thousands, given the fact the vaccine has been widely distributed both here and in Britain, uh, amongst other countries, uh, fairly broadly. So the side effect profile is something that although may be scary, may create some anxiety, um, is, is, is not uh, significant to worry or to dissuade people from actually getting the vaccine. If you see on the slide, um, we've got <clears throat> Matt uh, McClung and uh, Joe Pluth, who went to get the vaccine for us, and then a picture on the lower slide of the actual uh, vaccine vials that we would draw the vaccine out of. All right, um, I'm going to go over some COVID-19 uh, vaccine facts and have Dr. Sirio kind of uh, put his information in here too, but um, as Dr. Shearer has already said, the COVID vaccine will not give you COVID-19. None of the COVID-19 uh, vaccines currently in development uh, in the United States use the live virus that causes COVID-19. It typically takes a few weeks for the body to build the immunity after the vaccination. That means it's, it's possible um, a person could be infected with the virus that causes COVID-19 just before or just after vaccination and get sick. This is because the vaccine has not had enough time to provide protection. So COVID-19 uh, vaccines will not cause you to test positive on a COVID-19 viral test. Um, people who have gotten sick with COVID-19 may still benefit from getting the vaccine. And I'm gonna have Dr. Sirio uh, go over that because I think that's a question that uh, I've gotten a lot of um, people asking me, can they get the vaccine if they've already been sick and should they get the vaccine if they've already been sick? Yeah, the, the current recommendation is if you've had COVID already, that you should still get vaccinated. And the primary reason is because although the body has created the capacity to respond uh, with a, a, an immunologic response to the vaccine, it's not clear how long that might last for. Um, now, frankly, we don't know how long the vaccine's effect will last for, but it would be expected uh, as in most vaccines, that the, the effect should be long lasting. And by that, it could be forever. And we don't know that. We won't know that for some time yet, obviously. Or it could be years. And I would give the example that most of us get a tetanus shot booster every 10 years. So the likelihood that this will be long lasting is high. And it's not clear how long, in fact, the, uh, the body's natural response to having been infected would last. I know that as we were vaccinating folks today, one of the questions that came up, well, well, I have to get a booster every year. And at that point, at this point, the answer to that is most likely, although we don't know for certain, no. So the main reason basically is to, to enhance your res response to the, the point in time where you might be re-exposed to the virus. Because we, know, we do know that although very small, there have been some cases around the world where people have gotten infection twice. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Serio go over uh, receiving an MRI va mRNA vaccine will not alter your DNA. Yeah. So let me step back before I answer that question. There's a lot of stuff out in the internet, um, in the lay press, with respect to uh, potential problems with the vaccine. And, and let me say that most of them, um, as I've read them and learned about them, are, are, are just false. 
uh, that there's really no reason or rhyme be behind them, recognizing that for many people, vaccines are somewhat controversial in their minds with respect to safety and efficacy. This vaccine, although having come to market and the Moderna one, assuming it's approved tomorrow, which is what the, the FDA is likely to do, have gone through the same rigorous process that any other vaccine has gone through for approval, the timelines are sped up. And that's in part because the technology that this vaccine em employs is not new. The, the, the vaccine itself is new, but the technology has been in development for almost 20 years, since about 2002. And in fact, there were two vaccines that were developed using this, this technology for both MERS and for SARS, two other diseases in the last decade that people were concerned would become pandemics that were not needed worldwide because ultimately those viruses died out on their own. But these same technologies were in fact used to develop those vaccines, so this is not new technology. It's a safe technology because in fact, it's not including any viral material in the injection. What it is basically is a process that's going to stimulate your body's development of the proteins that are on the outside of the virus that you've probably all seen in that picture with the spikes. What this is doing is creating those spike proteins and letting your body have an antibody response, that is the chemicals that fight infection to that spike particle. This is created by something called mRNA. mRNA lives in our cells and is a product of DNA. DNA is the material that makes us who we are and it lives in a relatively protected part of every cell, the nucleus. There is no way for mRNA to get into the nucleus to affect the DNA. And in fact, just the opposite. DNA will in fact create the, 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 the process of creating RNA. And RNA is what the body uses to create protein. So all the protein that we have in our body is created by RNA. What this virus, what this, what this vaccine is doing is creating the body's capacity to produce protein that then is responded to to create the immunity. So it's a little bit complicated, but fundamentally, there's no way for the vaccine's RNA to get into the cell to affect the DNA. And the second piece is that the RNA is relatively short-lived. So that over the course of several days after you've been injected with the vaccine, the RNA that you've been injected with is gone. In fact, that's also part of the reason why you need the second shot, is to reboost that protein production several weeks down the road. Because the first shot gives most people about 60% chance of immunity, and that second shot will give us about 95%. But be assured that, in fact, there is no capacity for this to affect DNA. Laura, do you want me to touch on the issue of pregnancy mm -hmm. also? Mm -hmm. So similarly, there have been concerns about pregnancy. Should I get this if I'm pregnant or want to become pregnant? I'll answer that two ways. Um, as with most trials of any new medicine, pregnant women were not tested. So we don't really have any good data on pregnant women and its effect. So pregnant women should really have a conversation with their primary care physician or their obstetrician to get some sense of what they should or should not do. But I think it's really important to understand what we've learned about this disease and the virus with respect to pregnancy. And that is, the concern has been, does this affect what I've seen out in the literature in terms of social media and whatnot, is can this affect the placenta? And the reason is because the spike proteins on the virus have some similarity to some of the proteins on the outside of placental cells. So the fear has been, well, if the body's gonna to respond to the spike protein on the virus, why can't it affect the proteins on the placenta? The women who have had COVID around the world <clears throat> have been looked at in a fairly rigorous way to see if there's been any increased rate of miscarriage among those women. And the answer to that question is no. Women who have had COVID have not had higher miscarriage rates than the background rate for women in the world who have not had COVID. So the implication would be that the spike protein does not stimulate a response of the body to the placenta. Bottom line, if you're pregnant, we don't have the safety data, speak with your doctor, but at the same time, be assured that COVID as a disease has not had a bad outcome with respect to pregnancy. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Serial. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Emily. <clears throat> All right. So, so uh, just one more thing, Emily. I do. I do want people to to understand um, that again. Uh, the first wave of the vaccinations that we're giving are for the healthcare workers. And I know we've gotten some calls about from the community about wanting to schedule uh, their COVID uh, vaccinations. Um, and so, but we want you to know that we will continue to um, update you on when that becomes available. And when that does, we'll get information out to you. So thanks everybody for watching today. Great, thank you, Dr. Siria, Laura, and Nana. Um, so we do have a couple more questions regarding the COVID vaccine, but we will take those at the end. Um, and just a reminder, our next update will be um, two weeks from today, Thursday, December 31st at 7 p.m. And you can email questions um, to COVID at WinnebagoTribe.com. Um, and those also can include vaccine questions as well. So um, we will now turn it over to Dan Farringer with Winnebago Public Schools for an update. Dan? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first thing is, it is vital that we continue to take the necessary steps to keep our teaching and learning community healthy and able to teach and learn. Please follow the recommended guidance from the governor and health department. Practice the three C's, avoid crowded places, avoid close contact, avoid confined spaces. Also continue to follow health safety measures, washing your hands often, cleaning and sanitizing high touch areas in your homes and classrooms, physical distancing at least six feet apart and wearing a mask when six when not six feet apart and physical distancing is not possible. Considering whether or not your activities or trips out of town are necessary, ensure everyone in your household wears a mask every time you leave the house and go out into the public. Avoid large gatherings as much as possible, including gatherings with relatives if they do not live in your home. Some of the data from WPS regarding COVID, as of 12-17, we did have an additional certified staff member test positive for COVID, which makes the total of 15 known since May. And we had one new classified staff, which makes that total 14 since June. Protocol is being followed and no staff members are in the building if he or she tests positive until the notice says he or she can return. We continue to keep the building and classroom disinfected. We continue to wear a mask, use desk shields, use hand sanitizer and social distance when possible. It is imperative that health safety measures are practiced. On uh, Monday night, the school board approved to change the school calendar from student in-person days on Monday, December 21st and Tuesday, December 22nd to teacher work days. Students in grades seven through 12 who have any grade below C will have the opportunity to come in Monday and Tuesday to work on improving his or her grades. WPS will notify the students who need to be here. Also, the Internet Cafe will be available on Monday and Tuesday from 1 to 3 for any homebound student who is in need of tutoring assistance. School will resume on January, Monday, January 4th. A large majority of the students who were homebound will be returning to the in-person learning next semester, which starts on February 1st, 2021. The week of January 4th, the administration will be reaching out to the parents and guardians of students who are going to remain on homebound setting to set up a meeting to sign a second semester contract. 93 of the 137 students who were homebound first semester are coming back, which is 68% returning to the K-12 building. Also, winter activities are in full swing. Please be aware that every site has different mandates at, as far as spectators go. Mr. James will uh, continue to send out the information prior to each contest. Also a note, the NSAA has uh, the Nebraska Schools Activities Association has kept us in the yellow phase with the current um, mandates that were in place previous, 25% uh, in the crowds, which includes the 25% does include the grandparents. We've had that question. Also then stay safe and have a happy holiday season. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Next, we will go to Little Priest Tribal College for an update with Manoj. 
Good evening, uh, Winnebago community. Uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and Happy New Year from Little Priest Tribal College. Um, again, uh, what an exciting day uh, for our community that the vaccine is here and first step towards complete uh, normalcy um, to our community. Uh, till the time, till everybody's vaccinated, please heed uh, warnings from the public health officials. Little Priest Tribal College uh, will be completing their 2020 fall semesters tomorrow. Tomorrow is our annual holiday party. After that, the school will be closed till January 3rd. School reopens on January 4th. All classes um, begin on January 11th. We are really hoping that all students who are interested to take classes will try to sign up either tomorrow or as soon as the school reopens on January 4th. Uh, as I've stated before, this is one of the few semesters where we're offering free classes, free laptops, and free textbooks. Um, we are also uh, offering some dorms, dorm rooms for with limited capacity on a first-come, first-served basis. So it is very high time for our students and community members if they're interested in taking any classes now is the time. In the spring semester, we have all four modalities, face-to-face, -face, online, hybrid, and high flex options open for students. It's very important for you guys to attend the student orientation beginning January 5th. There will be a opening cer ceremony of our new buildings in the first week of January uh, of our new IT building and our new dorm. More information will be released to the public as soon as we have it. It has been a tough year for our faculty, staff, and our students. And I'm grateful for the community support to Little Priest Tribal College in these trying times. But uh, we have come out of this successfully. So far, Little Priest Tribal College had a total, total of six cases with one active case as of today. So we have done an extremely good job in sanitizing and cleaning our buildings and keeping our employees safe. Again, I want to take this opportunity to thank the community, the Tribal Council, a huge shout out to Pandemic Task Force and subcommittees for uh, supporting Little Priest Tribal College and our community. God bless everybody. Have a safe holiday and we'll see you in 2021. Thank you again. Thank you, Manoj. Uh, next up, we will go to Ho-Chunk, Inc. with an update from Ryan Martinez. Good evening. I have a brief update for Ho-Chunk, Inc. Our summer, paid, or our summer college internship program is accepting applications. Please encourage college students you know to use this time over winter break to get their materials together. We're currently accepting online applications. As well. You can find the application and additional information on the Ho-Chunk, Inc. Facebook page. That is my update for this evening, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ryan. Um, and lastly, we will go to Mayan Beltran with an update from Winnevegas. Mayan? Good evening, Winnebago community. Uh, the update from Winnevegas Casino Resort. Uh, in the last few weeks, we have complied with our uh, Governor Reynolds in Iowa with uh, emergency declaration of closing down restaurants and bars at 10 o'clock. Uh, that has been lifted now, and uh, we are currently back to normal casino hours on our restaurants and our bars. So depending on what day of the week, weekends or later, uh, as far as the restaurant's concerned, middle of the week, we're closing at normal times. Check our website for further details, and the bars will be doing last calls at 1.30 a.m. on open nights. So as far as the casino is concerned, uh, we have done a great job. Uh, following uh, evolution of CDC and WHO guidelines on COVID-19 and how uh, to deal with those. We've had our share of either positives or close contacts of employees and have done a great job with our human resources department to address those concerns, quarantine employees, document, and ensure the safety of all of our employees, their families, our guests, and the community around us. So, uh, again, as you come into Winnebago's Casino Resort, please uh, 
follow our, our guidelines, mandatory guidelines of wearing your mask, checking your temperature, hand sanitizing and washing your hands uh, to stay safe. And uh, thank you from Buena Vegas Casino Resort. Thank you, Mayan. And that's actually a good segue into our questions uh, that were submitted today from community members. Um, there was a question in regards to the elders party that's being held at Winter Vegas. Can you uh, briefly uh, go over some of the safety protocols that will be in place? Yes, thank you. Uh, so we are going to be doing our, our party. We, we spoke with the senior program and Janet Bird before we made the decision with that uh, blessing to continue with that party for our Winnebago elders. Uh, and we're doing it here at Winter Vegas in our event center instead for safety reasons and social gathering. So as uh, with our business, um, we have in the event center, we're going to be playing bingo. We do have our plastic partitions up where we only allow up to four players per table and uh, social distance throughout the property uh, for safety. Also, masks are required. Uh, we do have hand sanitizing stations. And, of course, we encourage you to, to wash your hands. We're also going to be uh, serving in to-go um, containers the food. We will have water and pop and, and bottles so you self-serve yourself so you're not touching the same uh, equipment to, to have a drink, as well as having coffee supplied in to-go as well. So uh, utensils will be in, in wrapped so that each one individually get their own. So for the safety guidelines as with our business and with the bingo, uh, we are following what we currently do to allow uh, patrons in our casino and to run our business. And again, uh, if, if you don't feel safe coming to this party at this time, we understand that. You know, we'll see you when you do feel safe coming to our parties or to the casino to frequent uh, the business. But anybody who does feel safe, you're more than welcome to join us. Uh, the party information is out there on the website, on the Winnebago website, um, and uh, we're going to have a good time. We're going to do some raffle drawings. We're going to uh, enjoy a dinner, play some bingo, uh, and we might get a visit from Santa and Mrs. Claus as well. Great. Thank you so much for that information, Mayan. Um, the next question is in regards to the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, it asks, will the COVID-19 vaccine affect different races with different gen genetics? How many Native Americans were tested in the clinical trials? Um, I'm going to direct that question to um, the hospital and health department. And I know, uh, Dr. Sirio, um, I think you had some response to that. Yeah, so the, the, the requirement the FDA put into place was that the both virus, well, any, any of these virus uh, vaccines had to be tested in diverse populations. And they had to be uh, re reflective of the population of the United States. So Pfizer's final numbers for the just over 40,000 people that they tested the vaccine in was about 1.1% uh, of the total population that they vaccinated were Native Americans. Uh, the Native American population, to my understanding, is about 2, 2.5% in the country. So it's, it's not exactly the same, but it's close. And that translates of that 40,000 to about four to 500 people uh, were tested were Native American. And the effect, effectiveness, effectiveness rates across ethnicities and races, uh, to my understanding of the data, were, were equivalent. Great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is, uh, what happens if an individual doesn't get their second dose of vaccination in the series um, in the three weeks timeline? So the, there's a couple of important things to tease out in that question. The first is, I think that it's really incumbent on all of us to make sure that we remind people that they, at least at this point in time, are getting a precious resource. Uh, this is limited, obviously, and, and, the, and, the, and the privilege that we each have of getting the vaccine needs to be respected by, in fact, going through the full sequence. Uh, because, in fact, we don't have the supply to meet the demand right now. So as an obligation to our fellow humans, I think that's important. Um, the second piece of that is that if you don't get the second vaccine, as I mentioned earlier, the effectiveness is about 60% as opposed to 95, close to 100%. And we, we would suspect that the duration of the impact of the vaccine will be shorter. Um, and, and those, I think, are, are the two, two main pieces of, of, of this. 
I think you also asked in that question, what if it's not exactly three weeks? Um, but the data you know, had, had some flexibility around it. So there were folks in both trials, Pfizer's and Moderna's, that got it a few weeks before the second dose was due, and there were a few that got it as long as a week out. And there, too, the effectiveness was equal. There is a difference in the time frame. The Pfizer vaccine's redo second dose is at three weeks. The Moderna will be at four weeks. But there is a window of a couple of days before and a couple of days after that will be fine. Now, certainly at the hospital, what we're doing is we're scheduling them right on track at three weeks, or Moderna will be four weeks to, to in fact, be rigorous about it. But people need not be overly concerned if they're there too early or a day or too late. And that should, should, should certainly not in, impede them from getting the second dose. You know, if they miss that three-week mark for Pfizer or four-week for Moderna, uh, they needn't be embarrassed. They needn't be concerned. They needn't be anxious. They need the second shot. Great, thank you, Dr. Sirio. Um, so, another next question was um, in the second phase of uh, the CDC's distribution plan, um, it mentioned uh, essential workers. And um, their question was um, what kind of essential workers are included in phase two that aren't in phase one? Um, so, uh, Mona, I know you're working with the community closely and our community partners. Um, is there um, can you give some examples of what essential workers outside of healthcare would be? Yeah, thank you. Um, so just an idea of some of the um, essential workers would be like our IT, uh, water operators, uh, school personnel, um, wake and burial, um, those that are vital to uh, the, the tribal organization operations. Great, perfect, thank you for that example, Mona. Um, and then the very last question, um, a uh, community member asked, my daughter is eight years old, does she need to get a COVID vaccine? Um, Laura or Dr. Sirio, do you wanna answer that one? Yeah, the answer at this point in time is no. Uh, the vaccine has not been approved for children under the age of 16. It has not been tested in children under the age of 16. So there are several issues there. One is uh, we have no data on its safety or its effectiveness in, in younger children. Um, two, we do know that kids, obviously, by the data that Mona presented earlier, do in fact become infected. Uh, fortunately, the vast majority of them will have an illness that is uh, minor or relatively inconsequential to them. Now, again, they can spread it to loved ones, family, other kids, so they need to be uh, quarantined and masked and, and all the other good, good social distancing we're doing. But at the moment, right now, the vaccine is not available to children under 16 because we do not have an understanding of the effectiveness or safety of the vaccine. Great. You, thank you for that answer, Dr. Sirio. Um, that concludes today's uh, COVID update. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, please tune in um, uh, to our Facebook page and our website. Um, you can visit www.winnebagohealth.com. Um, and the links to the health department uh, website and the hospital websites are there uh, for more information as well, as well as the Winnebago Public Health uh, Facebook page and uh, 12 Crimes Unity Hospitals Facebook page. So thank you all for joining and we will see you in two weeks from today, Thursday, uh, December 31st at 7 p.m. Thank you.